Hello there all you absolutely magnificent people and welcome back to another episode of An Ecologist Plays where we talk about nature while playing games. I'm Will, an ecologist by training, which means I need to know a lot about all random stuff in nature. So let's jump right into the next mission, which is... Da -da -da -da, the Harvest. And this time around we'll be playing with challenge mode on because, well, 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 there will be some very, very interesting parasitoids present in this mission. So let's jump right into it. Challenge mode on, and I've always gone for stun. This time around, let's go for taunt. Just because I've never used taunt, and apparently taunt is quite good. So let's jump right in, shall we? And here we are. This young queen has successfully raised her first daughters beneath the leaf litter of mm -hmm. the rainforest floor. The nutritious fungus she fed them as larvae is now dwindling. If they don't find food quickly, they will all starve. The juicy grubs nearby are a staple meal for many underground opportunists, mm -hmm. but for now at least, they will go ignored. This budding Atacephalotis leaf cutter colony has only one viable source of food, and it must be collected above ground. Alright, so what we're doing now is we're just initially at least digging out an area for our leaves and an area for the waste. I'm going to make it a very, very nice little area in a moment, but for now, this is what we need. And yeah, this is definitely not ideal yet. I want to set up some media and I know it's horrible, but let's get that here for now. Okay, so there's a chamber here. When we have enough food, we can do that. The small scouting party of minor workers could lead any number of deadly jungle creatures mm -hmm. back to their undefended queen. They will need time and luck on their side. The ants' activities outside the nest have not gone unnoticed. They are being watched. Alright, so just starting out, we are in already in real danger. We, of course, have a bunch of leaves we can harvest on this side, but there's also a jumping spider, again, right over here, that will most likely wreak havoc on our ants if it gets too close to where we are foraging, so we are keeping an eye on them. Now, normally, we can alternate between this patch over here and this patch over here. But notice, we've got some interesting flies right over there. These are the forret flies. And well, they are tiny. I mean, we've got a whole bunch of other little bugs here as well. I believe these are some of the hemiptera, some of the leaf hoppers. They're not going to attack us, but these little guys, oh, they are going to be a nuisance. So for a day, or the humpback flies, or the zombie flies, as they're also called, or the ant decapitating flies, or even coffin flies, a whole bunch of names for these types of flies here. They are parasitoids, and we'll talk about them when we are inevitably attacked by them. So for now, we are going to just avoid this section of the of the leaves so we're not going to go for those ones we are just going to go for this patch over here and hopefully our ants over here our minimum workers can get the leaves over here quickly enough to actually bring to the brood chamber here so that everything can run smoothly so that we can start getting some media workers down Okay, so we have got three media already, and they are just kind of working with these ones. Now, the level one media will be pretty pointless against the forward flies, and the minor work is also completely useless against the forward flies. They will be parasitized by the forward flies, so we are going to have to upgrade these ones, the bigger ones, the medias, and the majors later on, to level three as soon as possible. Now, here comes the jumping spider again, wandering through the area. Let's just keep an eye on him. The most accessible leaves are located to the north of the mm. nest entrance. However, another atta colony has already laid claim to them. The close proximity of these nests places the two colonies in direct competition with one another. Time will tell which has the potential to grow into a great empire, and which will submit to the unforgiving law of the undergrowth. Of course, we've got our other Atacephalotus colony right up there. So we've got a bit of intraspecific competition going on there with the ones at the top there. We've got to, of course, collect 10,000 leaves before they collect 10,000 leaves. Right, now we are just barely in the lead. Or we were a moment ago, we still are. We are like five leaves in the lead, so that's wonderful. So, of course, as we talked about previously, the leafcutter ants here, they're not eating the leaves directly. Instead, they are collecting it, taking it back to the nest, and then they are letting the fungus break it down. In this case, the fungus that they are farming are what we call obligate symbionts, meaning that the fungus cannot survive on their own. There are also some species in the lower agriculture with the leafcutter and some species of fungi there that are what we call facultative symbionts, meaning they can survive out on their own in the world outside. But these fungi that we are growing in our brood chambers here, they are bound to the utter species, to the ants. They cannot survive in the world outside. 
We're just going to dig out a little bit more and get some more nest chambers going. And now what I also really want to do is I want to just clear out this section over here. Clear out a bit of space for us. So I'm going to bring my media back into the nest so they can help to clear out this section over here. And here comes a rove beetle. These rove beetle larvae are distant relatives of the European Devil's Coach Horse. Despite and it's dead. a few million years of separation, they share the same carnivorous appetite, mm -hmm. razor-sharp pincers, and most importantly, a fearsome final form. Just going to clear this section as well. We try to get as clear as possible now. Okay, so the area here is now safe. Let's take the media back to the collection of leaves. And now that we have cleared a nice section here, let's add a few more refuse dumps. Because, well, unfortunately, the refuse has built up. But now that we've got this area open, I think it's going to be a little bit easier for the minimum workers to actually carry on moving around. And we're also going to just plop down some nest workers here. Now, unfortunately, I think the leaves here are almost done, which means we need to head into <laughs> the area with the forward flies. Oh, that's not going to be nice. So, unfortunately, as we come into this area over here, the forward flies, which should be hanging around, there we go, there they are. They are going to start parasitizing us, and oh my word, this is not going to be fun. Let's have a look and see whether we are attacked by them. So they're hanging around, waiting for ants, and they usually seem to target species in the Hymenoptera, so that will include wasps, bees, ants, those types of insects. And of course, since we've got our leafcutter ants here, they will be parasitized by these guys as well. Forage flies there we are go. attempting to lay eggs into the heads of ants on the foraging trail. Not sure Those where they are. Those towards the leaves can defend themselves. Those lumbered with cargo mm. will need assistance. So there. What's happening technically here now is a bit of mishmush over here, but we've got our Atacephalotus here, we've got our leafcutter, and, and we've got the forage fly, the Aposophalus, right over here as well. And it is trying to lay its egg somewhere, and it's got a very spiky ovipositor or egg-laying mechanism. And it will be injecting that into weak points in the armor of the ant, and it will be injecting that egg directly into the body of the Atta ant over here. And unless the ant is able to fight it off, well, it is going to be doomed. It's going to have the the larvae of this parasitoid fly developing in it. And unfortunately, I don't think our level 1 ants are going to be able to do that. The ants' internal organs will be slowly dissolved and consumed by the developing larva. We are going to basically lose that one over, I think, two minutes. In two minutes' time, we're going to lose that one. And every time our ants come here, there is now a chance. There we go. I think that one is also being parasitized. There is a fly right up there. Very, very quick that they are laying the eggs in there. They're constantly flying around and constantly doing this. But despite this, we are still in the lead when it comes to collecting the leaves. So that is nice. Now, hopefully, we can collect enough leaves here now so that we can actually upgrade these to tier 3. And we can then actually just go off into this area over here, which also has some forest flies right over here somewhere. Right over here, you can see them hanging around. We can come into this area then without worrying about being parasitized by the forward flies. I think if we fight off enough of these forward flies, they will go away. But we can't fight them off when, when we're carrying leaves unless we've got tier 3. You can see a whole bunch of them buzzing around here. <laughs> this is going to be a nuisance. You can see a lot of our ants are actually moving quite slowly. And this may be that they are infected with the larvae of the parasitoids of these forward flies. Now you'll... Notice that I'm calling them parasitoids rather than parasites. Parasitoids are species that will lay their eggs in another creature, invertebrates most of the time at least. They will be laying it in that creature and then the larvae of the parasitoid will be developing within the body of the host species and they then kill them at the end of the life cycle usually. A lot of wasps are parasitoid. There are lots of parasitoid wasps that target things like spiders, like the tarantula hawk for example, that is a parasitoid wasp. And then also things like certain flies, like these forehead flies are also parasitoids. An ant has fallen prey to a wandering oh. harvestman. Its long slender legs keep its vulnerable body elevated high above the leaf litter. And when threatened, it can release strong smelling odors to deter other predators. So of course, here yeah, we do have our harvestman. Oh, I love harvestman. I haven't seen one in ages though. But again, if you look at the harvestman here, you'll notice that even though it is an arachnid, because while well, it has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight legs, or four pairs of legs, it has got a bit of a weird body. In that it looks like it has one big body segment, whereas spiders have got two clearly distinct body segments. The cephalothorax, which will be the head and the 
the thorax, the chest section of the spider, and then the abdomen at the back. Whereas it seems like harvestmen at least have one section. They technically do have two, but it's just so fused here that it looks like one. And also you'll notice that this little guy over here only has two eyes, whereas most spiders will in fact have eight eyes. That is another big difference. And harvestmen also do not have venom, whereas almost all spiders will have venom. And there we go, we have chased him away. Running around, I think it has severed a limb. Yes, it has. We've got three limbs on the one side here and four on the other side. This is the process of autotomy. It's self-amputation where they sever a limb to try and escape. Overwhelmed by the defensive leafcutter mm -hmm. forces, the harvestman decides to make a swift exit. Right, so I think we're doing quite well here. We are collecting a lot of leaves in the process and we will be able to upgrade some more of our media Day here. has arrived and the creatures of the night scurry back to the dark crevices of the undergrowth. For the ants, however, the objectives of the day remain unchanged. Locate vegetation, defend supply lines, and process leaves. There is no time for rest. A brightly patterned jumping spider, hmm. say Casviri de Purpurius, has subdued Ooh. one of the workers. Okay, well, we've killed this it already. This expert solo hunter combines extreme agility with incredible forward vision allowing it to pounce on unsuspecting prey with pinpoint accuracy. I love jumping spiders. Absolutely love them. The jumping spiders, as mentioned before, really amazing eyesight. They do rely on the eyesight to find their food. And here we go. Here is one right over here as well. I'm just going to wait for it to come out into the sun a little bit. There we go. So first of all, Veridi purpureus means green and purple. So Veridis is green, purpureus being purple. So of course, well, if you kind of, kind of squint, you can imagine that as being green and that as being purple. Although for me, that would be turquoise red rather than green purple. But anyway, so it refers to the coloration of the jumping spider here and if you have a look at it from above this is what we call disruptive camouflage whenever we have got lines and spots like this as well it's there to make this more difficult to spot difficult to imagine that you know a brightly colored jumping spider like this one over here will be difficult to spot but it is it's relatively difficult the light and dark are supposed to mimic like grass blades casting a shadow over a different surface so a lot of species like frogs like this one over here they will have those longitudinal lines lines running from the head to the bottom there and that is going to be alternating in dark and light and it's supposed to mimic grasses and the shadows that they cast the lighter spots on the head here, that's supposed to mimic dappled light. So light shining through the canopy of the forest, hitting the forest floor. And if this head were just one color, it would have been easier to spot. But with the little spots here, pardon the pun, it's more difficult to spot. So it's supposed to like mimic light shining through the canopy and hitting the ground here. Now, of course, looking at the face of our jumping spider friend here. This does appear to be a female. Males of the jumping spiders in particular have got a bit, bit of a tuft of, at the front here. That sperm containing organ that they will use in courtship and in mating with a female. So they'll transfer sperm to that little club shaped appendage at the tips of the pedipalps over here. So the pedipalps being these little mouth parts over here. These being the chelicerae. And then of course we've got the pedipalps in the front here. These miniature legs. In jumping spiders they will very often wave that around in a bit of a dance to try and attract the female. So uh, yeah, this one most likely is a female. And then of course, as I've mentioned, they will transfer sperm. The males will transfer sperm to those club appendages at the tips of the pedipalps and they will transfer that to the female during mating. But very importantly, look at those eyes there. Massive forward-facing eyes of the jumping spider. Very, very good vision. A relatively small dot that they can see. So a certain section of the entire screen will be in focus and the rest will not be. So if we were a jumping spider, our vision would kind of look like that rather than this. So they have got limited sight in terms of what is in focus, but that section there is extremely well in focus. But the other eyes here, of course, can pick up peripheral movements and movement of things around here. And then they can turn around and face whatever they are seeing moving with their big eyes there. And that can then be in focus. And this helps them to really have pinpoint accuracy when it comes to jumping at something and catching that something. So catching their prey. Anyway, so there we go. We've got that little jumping spider right over there. We're still collecting leaves and we basically have finished collecting the leaves over here. We're also going to have two more level three media now as well. Now, what we're going to do now is, of course, get a whole bunch of workers because, well, we've got a bit of a problem in terms of waste. So we need a lot of minimum workers to get the waste to this section over here. 
We also do need more waste disposal facilities. Technically, as I've mentioned before, we, we would have had a whole bunch of specialized nest workers that their only job is to actually be here in the garbage disposal area and getting rid of the waste. That they never allowed to go to the rest of the colony. They would be here, other ants would bring the waste to this section here, they would pick it up and take it into the refuse piles. They never allowed into the rest of the colony because lots of diseases can be present in this area. I mean, look at that. This one is now diseased. Shame, shame, shame. And the utter colony here, the leaf cutters do not want to have diseases spreading in their colony. So if you are unfortunate enough to be a worker in the refuse dumps, well, you're never seeing the rest of your colony again. Okay, we have finished collecting leaves there. Let's actually come to this section over here. I don't want to take the rest of the leaves here because there are forward flies right over there. And I'm going to avoid the forwards as much as possible. Thus far, we are still in the lead with when it comes to the food, so that's marvelous. Leaf cutters aren't the only ants nearby. Ah, trap draw two ants. Two colonies joust for territory. Odontomachus bowery trap mm. jaws roam the clearing. They can be found hunting alone wow. or in small packs for vulnerable invertebrates to take back to their nest. They use snapping jaws. Speaking of the snapping jaws, I don't think we can see it, but they would be running around with their mouths open. And as I've mentioned before, they can slam that shut quite rapidly, generating quite a bit of force. And yes, they can use it against the things that are trying to kill or eat, but they also use it very often to escape. When you see them jumping back, well, that is them snapping their jaws. To bludgeon their targets, exerting 300 times and it their is now dead. weight in a <laughs> single blow. So if they, oh, there we go. We've got a jumping spider here as well. Come on guys, kill it. And it is dead. Okay, so it is now safe again to harvest leaves. Wonderful. Okay, what we're going to do is we're going to move the workers, the min the minor workers, they're just going to come and collect leaves over here because there are no forward flies over here. We're going to get our media workers to come up here because we do have quite a few level 3 media workers. And let's just get some more, shall we? So that they are more resistant to the forward flies. Of course, the forward flies, being a typical parasitoid, they don't want to risk their own lives. Instead, they do want to just lay their eggs with as little risk themselves as possible. They won't target the level 3, or if they do target in this case, if they, if they do target the level 3 uh, medias, then they will be fought off by those medias of ours. So this section over here, we don't have any forward flies. We're going to just have the normal minor workers collecting leaves right over here. The media, they can do the more difficult and dangerous task. <laughs> Yeah, you see, this one here is moving very slowly. It has got the larva of that forward fly. You can see it's much slower than the other one. Uh, it's much slower because it, it has got the larva feeding on it. Now, the zombie flies, they are amazing. In North America, there is Atacephalus uh, borealis, I think. So, northern borealis, I believe, is north. Their first major uh -huh. Its swollen head is filled with muscle to power its crushing jaws. Few stand against it in combat and escape unscathed. This champion warrior will make a fine addition mm -hmm. to the colony. So yeah, this is the reason why we've got our, our mages here. They are going to defend against these two guys over here. These rove beetles. And against whatever is over here. There we go, two more rove beetles. They don't stand a chance against our mages. But with the Apocephalus borealis, the northern one in North America, they will, uh, and unfortunately, you see, they, that one died. The Technically, the fly has now hatched out of it. So the larva has pupated and it has killed the leafcutter ant in the process. But uh, Apocephalus borealis, what it does, is also known as the ant decapitating fly. Because what they will do is, at some point, and they often will also infect things like the red imported fire ants, which is amazing. It may be a bit of a biological control of those ants. So with that Apocephalus, what happens is that the larvae develop in the body of the ant. As they then get larger, they actually move to the head of the ant, and there they will start eating some of the brain. And they basically turn the brain into mush and digest and eat that. So the ants are running around for about two weeks with less brain than usual. Which means, you know, there is hope for politicians all over the world that even with half a brain, you can still function. So just before that, Apocephalus borealis then is ready to pupate and turn into an adult. Adult fly, so it's still a larva and it then turns into an adult. It will secrete an enzyme that then severs the connection 
between the head and the body of the ant, causing the head to drop off. Hence the name decapitating fly or ant decapitating fly. And the reason it then does this is the larva actually pupates in the severed head of the ant, which is just amazing. That's just brutal. I think now we can actually bring out our mages. They can try to be a bit better at defending our squadrons. I mean, we have now set up a nice section over here as well. Let's get some more media. One of the ants Ooh, hello there, mimic. prey to a young leaf mimic praying mantis. Nice. Once in range, its long razor-clad forelegs can ensnare and impale victims with lightning speed. There we go. It is finally dead as well. So, of course, the mantis, the mantis there was hidden on our map. We could not see it initially until it started moving. And that's the idea with mantises overall. They're very well camouflaged. And most camouflaged things are generally not moving around. It's pointless being well camouflaged. There are intruders if... in the nest. Oh. Hello, Odontomachus. Okay, we do have some problems here with the Odontomachus in our nest. But here comes the cavalry. This will teach you not to mess with us. <laughs> there we go. Problem solved. There are also two more Odontomachus trap draw ants moving around here. So we're just going to try and... Make sure they don't terrorize our poor little guys any more than necessary. See that jumping away? That's when they feel threatened. They snap their jaws shut, they face the ground, snap their jaws shut, and then shoot backwards as an escape mechanism. We've got our soldiers. They tower over our minor workers, and they can obviously walk underneath our mages here. Really cool, but we are going to get more media. It's not the prettiest of sights, my nest, but it, it works. But yeah, with the mantises and lots of those camouflage creatures, the moment you move, the illusion is broken. So then things, then your predators and your prey will be able to spot you. But if you just remain immobile, it's a little bit more difficult for your prey and your predators to actually spot you. Okay, now there is a slight problem. We're facing more intraspecific competition here. Because, look here, the opposing Atacephalotus colony is actually heading into the patch of leaves that we are harvesting. So we're going to send our workers up here to an area where there, are, where there is no competition from the other Atta colony. We also have our level 3 media workers over here so that if the forward flies try to parasitize us, we can try to get rid of them in the process. However, I don't think it's really, really working. So let's, let's go away from here, guys. Let's go away from here. Let's head over to this section with our mages. They can come right over here. Everybody can come and collect leaves over here. Our mages can, however, protect us, hopefully, against... Oh, there we go. There's a leaf mimic mantis again. However, it is basically seeing its abdomen. Oh, there's another one. Oh, marvelous. Meet my major. Yeah, there we go. My mages, actually. Brilliant. Brilliantly done, guys. Or ladies, actually, again. Unfortunately... Our ants are moving constantly right through this area where the forward flies are. So the forward flies are having a blast. So we are about 500 food ahead of the opponent of the other Atta colony. So hopefully we'll win this mission. I am, however, just going to constantly continue making some mages here as well. Because I've got a suspicion that those ones are going to attack us soon. When, once we get closer to winning, they're going to come and try and attack us. So yeah, there we go. We've got another... Shame, minor work over here, really, really battling to stay alive. And within two minutes, this one is also going to be dead. Whether it actually reaches the nest with that, I don't know. So basically, the two minutes we've got here that this one is parasitized by that parasitoid fly there, that will simulate about two to three or some cases four or five weeks worth of life in that ant. So the life cycle of the forward flies takes usually about two weeks in good conditions, but in some cases it may take longer, up to 30 days more or less, as far as I recall. It can be a relatively slow process and the entire time the ant is alive. In some species of parasitoids, like the tarantula hawks that parasitize certain spiders, the spider is paralyzed. They must defend themselves. Let's see what's here. Oh, it's actually the other utter colony. Oh dear. Now, I suspect they're all going to come for us. Yeah. Everybody run back to the nest as quickly as you can. Except apparently our mages, which are deciding to fight. That's alright. You're holding the line while everybody else escapes. So we have been chased away from this section over here. And we are now using the opportunity to go and collect leaves where the other colony had been collecting leaves a moment ago. Hopefully they do not decide to press their advantage and come for us at our nest. 
does not seem to be the case. I do seem to be clustering here where they had the battle a moment ago. And the rest of them are collecting leaves up there. A few minutes later. As the leaves nearby are depleted and the superior hillside atta colony Aww. cuts off access to new pastures, the nest falls into ruin. The ants grow weak, the gardens <laughs> rot, and the queen is left to starve. Her reign has ended. No! Okay. Well, no, that is not what I, what I expected. I can't believe we lost that. I was like, okay, we, we're doing this. We're 500 ahead. We're 500 ahead. We should just continue doing what we're doing. And it turns out, no, we lost. Okay, so that last push by the Atacephalotus, by the hillside colony, has spelled our dooms. All right, let's try that again, shall we? And as you can see, I've already had a bit of a head start now, just to make sure that I can actually at least get ahead before all the chaos starts and before I've got to start focusing and talking and playing at the same time, because, well, that definitely has been a bit of a... A problem not that easy to do so as you can see i've got two groups of workers collecting here media as well as minor workers collecting here from the north currently the other utter lotus colony is somewhere to the left hand side here somewhere to the west and yeah we have been kind of not avoiding the flies here we have actually just gone and collected leaves even though the parasitoid flies are around so we just decided well stuff it we're going to just view that as operational losses and yeah here we are so what i'm now going to do is just get ready to put down a few majors because oh we are going to need those in a moment because if we get ahead too far the other Atacephalotus colony will most likely come and attack us so let's get our first majors set up their job is just going to be to protect the colony when the pawpaw hits the fan we've got them ready and we've got them waiting for the other Atacephalotus ants to come and mess things up so let's get ready here shall we but right, i'm actually just going to park them right over here uh, out of the brood chamber so they can just kind of chill over here on the side hopefully everything is all right there and of course it does take a lot of food to produce such a massive massive ant of course they would actually be best used actually protecting the trails here against other predators but currently it's actually quite all right we don't have any predators in that area so we don't have anything to protect against and thus far also the other Atacephalotus colony they seem to be focusing more on this cluster of seedlings over here and this cluster of seedlings over here they're going for some nice juicy succulent leaves over there and we are going for the nice succulent leaves to this side very very close to the other colony I mean the trail runs right along here and we are just over here so I suspect that it is quite possible that competition for the available leaves is going to become quite fierce in a moment. But for now, we're just quickly, we are doing what we call scramble competition. We are just rapidly grabbing as many leaves as we possibly can and hoping to get more leaves than the opponents. And we are uh, 1,600 leaves ahead, which I think is just great. And let's hope it stays that way. Of course, we do have a whole bunch of plants that are typical of the Amazonian rainforest, like this bromeliad that we've got in front here. Well, bromeliads like this one here, relatives of the pineapples, they are all in the bromeliaceae family. And yeah, pineapples also have a very similar structured flower that they will produce. So these bromeliads, if they're not flowering, they have very often got little puddles of water forming in, the, in their core. And the poison dart frogs, many of the species there, will actually lay their eggs and have their tadpoles living in these bromeliad ponds, basically. Because there are no predators. There are very, very few predators that will actually be able to survive in these areas. The only problem is that there is also not a lot of food in these little bromeliad puddles. So the female will, in many of the species, actually have some parental care, where she will hop along the forest floor. There will only be one tadpole living in a bromeliad pond, and she will go and lay an unfertilized egg there. Basically on a weekly basis feed her offspring and she'll hop kilometers along the forest floor and up the trees to go and lay her unfertilized eggs in these bromeliad ponds. So that's just really really amazing. I've mentioned it before in the Green Hell playthrough as well. I absolutely love bromeliads. We've got a bunch of them growing in our garden as well. We of course don't have poison dart frogs but that's you know besides the point. <laughs> uh, let's go and let's see here. Our ants are doing quite all right. That's marvelous. I think we should actually make another chamber of workers. 
after putting down some more mages here. And now the mages are going to just quickly protect us against, I think there is a velvet worm living in this section over here. Let's just check. Yep, there is indeed. But that velvet worm was no match for our mages. Oh, that is a major breakthrough to have them around here as well. I do believe that between these plants over here, this massive seedling over there, this medium sized one over here, and this cluster of little seedlings here, we should be able to reach 10,000 leaves. We just have to do it before the other colony does. Now thankfully we do have some mages that are still stationed here, they're just chilling around. We are getting another batch of media workers also going now. And once they are all set, we will send them off into the great big bad world. And hopefully they will be able to come and collect some leaves, possibly over here. Just a few last leaves over here. Every little bit will help. Of course, we've got the rove beetle there. Well, had a rove beetle there as well. And there are still a whole bunch of these parasitoid flies that are hanging around. And we are just kind of avoiding them at the moment. We've got a trail running past these ones over here. And just past these ones as well but we're not being distracted or tempted by these seedlings over here nor by anything that's still around in this area we're just sticking to our trail and it's amazing how these ants are just following the trail because well this trail that they are following seems to be the most cost effective way to reach the feeding grounds and it's amazing how a lot of ants like the matabele ants for example as well are able to find the most cost effective or time effective path between point A and point B, like those Matabele ants when they are raiding the termite colonies, even though some trails may be shorter, there may be obstacles on those trails. And the Matabele ants are amazing at finding the most time efficient way to travel between their nest and the termite mounds. And same here, the leafcutter ants also are following a trail that is very, very effective at getting them from point A to point B. No obstacles there, nothing to go around. They're just traveling between their nest and the leaf grounds. And of course, some of them do get distracted and attack the harvestmen there. <laughs> uh, yes, of course, they've got to get distracted somehow, at least a little bit. All right, so what I'll do now is I'll send group four over here. Oh, intruders, really? Well, now, luckily, I don't know what that was, but I think it was a rove beetle or maybe Odontomachus, the trap draw ant that made its way in here. But luckily, we've got a whole bunch of mages defending this area. But we're just going to send these, this last group of 14 media. They're just going to do some cleanup work of the leaves in this general vicinity. And even though it is a really great strategy to actually upgrade your ants, in this case, we haven't done that. I don't know. For this mission it seems we are again just going for quantity rather than quality so the tier 3 media would be immune against the flies that are hanging around here and they would also be very good at collecting leaves but it seems that for now at least this strategy of just having a whole bunch of ants going up and down up and down up and down doing their things it seems to have been working out quite well for us so that's what we're going to keep on doing at least unless we lose horribly in the next few minutes. Unfortunately, these two over here have been parasitized. And with the, what the parasitoids will often do, well, usually do at least, in if that with the hillside at a colony Ooh. is falling behind. With their demise at hand, they have no okay. choice but to strike back at their opponent. Okay, so we've got a bit of a problem. We've got a whole bunch of ants making their way to the colony, a whole bunch of soldiers. They are tier two and three. So we're recalling all our ants just to quickly mess them up. So here come the Atacephalotus. Of course, now this is interference competition. This is when they are trying. Okay, fine. You guys want to fight with us out here? Fine. We will come out here and fight you. It's one that came into the nest. This is what we call interference competition. They are trying to ruin our chances at actually uh, establishing a foothold here. They are trying to interfere with us. And, well, they did not succeed. So let's get back to feeding, shall we? We're just going to do the mad dash. We are almost there. We are just 230, 240 short. So what the parasitoids will very often do, and that's what I was trying to say before being so rudely interrupted by these Atta Cephalotus trying to attack us, they will keep their host alive. The larvae will keep their host alive until they are ready to pupate and turn into adults. So that means they will be feeding on everything but the vital organs. Except, of course, as I've mentioned earlier, with some of them that are feeding on the brains of the fire ants that are parasitizing, but even in those cases, it seems they are keeping them alive for as long as possible. They only really kill them just before they're ready to pupate, which is gruesome and amazing at the same time. So all the vital organs of a spider that's being parasitized by a tarantula, hawk, wasp, for example, 
all the ants that are being parasitized by the fungi, for example, like cordyceps, a fire cordyceps that will parasitize ants. And there we go, we have actually won. Yes! The ants have subdued their rivals and achieved dominion over the clearing. As the mm -hmm. competition withers, they will extend their territory in all directions, firmly establishing their agricultural empire. One day, this colony will number in the millions. Yes. They do get very large. Very, very large in size, the Atacephalotus colonies. Okay. Well now, so we have officially done that. We are again going to go for Royal Jelly. And just while we are still here, I do still want to finish talking. So we are just hanging around a bit here. But whether you're looking at the Tarantula Hawk Wasp, or whether you're looking at forward flies like these ones over here, or looking at the Fire Cordyceps parasitizing insects, whatever parasitoid you're looking at, they tend to keep their host alive as long as possible, not eating the vital organs. So they eat those last. So spiders being parasitized by the Tarantula Hawk Wasp, like the one in the photo that I've got up there, they are alive but paralyzed. They are, cannot move. And they just stay alive for a few weeks. It's like fresh food for the larvae of the wasp. And they're just staying alive and being slowly but surely eaten from the inside out until the larvae are ready to pupate and turn into adult tarantula hawk wasps. So that is the life cycle of parasitoids. Gruesome but amazing. And here, yeah, this is also a great place to then end today's episode, everybody. So thank you very much for joining us on this little adventure. Initial misfortune, but we made it through in the end. Now, on Sunday, Nick and I will be streaming again, and we will be streaming Enshrouded for the first time. So come and join us for a nice, relaxing stream in a new Wish game that released in January this year, as we take on the world of Enshrouded. So, until next time, everybody, stay safe. I'll see you all soon. Cheers!